Praise the Lord. We're so glad that you chose to join with us tonight. This is Pastor Randy Richardson with the Bible Heritage Pentecostal Holiness Church in Waycross, Georgia. And we're glad you tuned in. We're going to sing three or four hymns tonight, and uh, then we're going to get right into the Word. Uh, this song has been in my heart all day long. That will be a glad reunion day. I'm looking forward to the time we get to see those that have died and gone on to be with the Lord and uh, spend eternity with them. Praise the Lord.
praise the Lord. Page 214 has a song that says, He knows how. Yes, He knows how. I don't care what you're going through. The Lord knows how to fix it. He knows how to straighten it up. Praise God. <laughs> Oh 
praise the Lord. If you will, uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to speak on a subject I've entitled, How to Embrace a Gentle and Quiet Spirit Without Losing Your Identity. Let's read beginning in verse number 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. And when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart and the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner in former times the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid of any terror. Now we're going to look at verse 7 next week, a word to the husbands, but to, tonight we're going to look mainly to the women. And we're going to include men in this as well. This is just a good study. You never know. Some of you would think, well, I'm a single woman. You know, what do I need to know about a husband? And, but you know, the Bible teaches us, and we're going to see that later on, that the older women are to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. And so we're going to, we're going to teach you so that you can teach them what the Word of God has to say. Praise the Lord. And maybe you can forward this message to some of your grandchildren, your daughter, granddaughters, uh, daughters, uh, nieces, and uh, friends that you know are having struggles in their marriage. You know, God doesn't want uh, divorce. He doesn't want uh, problems in marriages. He doesn't want families that are bombarded by trouble. He wants a family to be in unity because when a family is in unity, look out, devil. Because when a family gets in tune with the Lord and they get all fine-tuned, uh, the devil has to get on the run. Praise the name of the Lord. Well, he starts off with a very uh, popular statement that preachers love to cram down women's throats. And that scripture is, wives be submissive to your own husbands. And I, I've seen pastors make women out to be slaves, literally slaves to their husbands and, and make them feel condemned when they don't uh, have, uh, when they have their own mind or when they want to speak up and say, no, this isn't right or, or what have you. But there, there's three separate scriptures in the Bible that command wives to be submissive to their husbands. Ephesians 5, 21 through 25 says submitting to one another. Notice that one, submitting to one another in the fear of God. In other words, we're all supposed to know what submission is. It's not just a woman thing. It, the men are supposed to submit to their wives, and wives are supposed to submit to their husbands, and I'm supposed to submit to some of my church members, and, and, and my church members are supposed to submit to each other. And, and this is what the uh, part of being a Christian is all about, is learning how to submit and so he says, after he says submitting to one another in the fear of God, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and also Christ is head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Paul also wrote to the Colossian church in Colossians 3, 17 through 19, when he said, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. So there's three separate scriptures in the Bible that teaches women to be submissive to their husbands. But we have that clarifier there as is fitting to the Lord. 
Let me give you an example. I had a lady one time that her husband uh, demanded that she bring a, a second woman into their bedroom and have a, a threesome. And the woman said, I will not do that. And he said, well, wives are supposed to submit to their husbands in everything. He, she says, yeah, but it's got to be fitting to the Lord. And so she put her foot down and said, that's not going to happen. And so there are a lot of men that want to twist that scripture and they want to make women feel like they've got to do everything they say. I went to a woman's house one time and her husband said, my food's not salty enough. And he kept pointing at the salt shaker that was just, you know, 18 inches away from his pan. And she had to get up from her seat and come over and grab the salt shaker and shake that salt on his food. I tell you, I don't think I have enough Jesus in me to get up and salt somebody else's food. But that's not what submission is all about. It's not having a servant and label that servant your wife. What does it mean to submit to your husbands, to your own husbands? First, um, submission in marriage is a sign of strength, not weakness. Because submission requires a, a degree, a great degree of personal strength of character to submit your will to somebody else's. There have been times in my life where I've had to submit to somebody that I didn't agree with. I had to submit to somebody that I didn't like. I had to submit to somebody that I thought was an idiot. They were my supervisor. And I, I, I didn't want to submit to them, but the Holy Spirit convicted me and reminded me that I had to submit as a sign of my Christianity to that lost man who was not right with God. And uh, so submission is married in marriage is the same type of thing. It's a spirit of respect for your husband, so much so that you want to bless him. It's a choice that you, you love him, you respect him to the point that you want to do good things for him. You want to please him and you want to bless him in every way that you can because when you do, the Bible teaches us that it helps us live a contentful, peaceful life together. If you've been married for three weeks or three minutes or 30 years, you know that marriage is a lot of work. You know that it's a lot of give, 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 and more give. Problems and disagreements between husbands and wives are inevitable. I, I, I know that, you know, some people share the room with two or three brothers and brothers, maybe even a sister. And, and, and shared small quarters and they learned how to share things. But some folks, they grew up in a home with their own bedroom and, and their mama waited on them hand and foot and then they get married to, to somebody and they expect them to be mama and wait on them hand and foot. <laughs> I, I tease uh, Alicia, she can cook biscuits now, but she couldn't for the first 15, 16 years of our marriage. She just couldn't cook a biscuit. And I'd have to tell her, well, Baby, cook them like my mama did. Go get the can and beat it on the side of the counter and open it up and stick it on the tray, and that was our biscuits. But she can make homemade, really good homemade biscuits now. Thank the Lord. Although I don't need them, but praise the Lord anyway for his blessings. But when we um, submit ourselves, we're not humiliating ourselves. We're not demeaning ourselves. We're not losing our identity. We're finding our identity in the Lord. Because there are some times where we have to say, Father, I really don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it as unto you. And I'm going to expect you to bless me in return for what I do in honor to you. And so uh, choosing to support your husband and choosing to respect him and choosing to... Uh, carry out uh, his needs and, and minister will help him to become more of the 
provider and the protector and the leader of his family. That's what uh, God was referring to in Genesis 2.18 when God said, It's not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Suitable for him. I believe that God has somebody for everyone if they choose and they want that. And God, I know my sister-in-law, when she passed away here a few weeks ago, when I spoke at her funeral, I said, if God had taken a rib out of my brother's side and created a woman, he would have made Christine, the woman that he was married to for 30 some odd years. And God knows how to give you someone that is a blessing to you. Praise the Lord. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and he wrote in Ephesians 5, 21, submitting to one another. We read that earlier. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Marriage should be give and take, give and take, give and take, but it is never equal. It's never equal. There are some days where I'm more needy than Alicia. There are some days she's more needy than I am. And so we have to help each other and Endure some things sometimes that you don't like per se. I, I, I've seen people who've had affairs and, and they tried to escape the reality of their marriage. Maybe their wife didn't fix up or, you know, she didn't give him much attention at home. And so he's out there trying to find this. And so he leaves his children and his wife and, and, and you know, forsakes his security and and everything and runs after this skirt and, and this woman leaves her husband to run after this man and, and they get together and everything and they just think they're just made from heaven for each other and they're, they're all so happy for just a little while. But then when reality sets, she finds out that he's just like the other one. He finds out she's just like the other one. In fact, I had a man one time, he came to me, he said, Pastor, I've been married three times, and he said, if I knew that my second and my third wife was going to be just like my first wife, I'd have stayed with my first wife because she was a good woman. <laughs> I thought, dear Lord, dear Lord, when you submit to your husband, you're bending to meet his needs, but you're making that choice yourself. It's not that he's expecting you to do that because then he's not loving you like Christ loved the church. He needs to love you like Christ loves the church. My wife has reminded me on many occasions. If you'll love me like Jesus loves the church, I'll do all the things that you need me to do to you. And I, and I, I have seen that to be true. Titus 2, 3 through 5, I alluded to this early in the message. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. Do you know some women don't like their children? And they have to be taught by the older women to love their children and how to love their children. Some women didn't have a good role model, and so the women of the church needed to step up and take their role and say, Honey, let me show you how to do this. Why don't you come over to my house tomorrow, and I'm going to make lunch for you. And, I, and, and, and bring your children with you. And then you, you grab a few toys. Maybe you've got some left over, or you have when your grandchildren come over. And you just sit there and teach her how to play with her children and how to have fun with her children. In this day and time, we've got a, a slew of women that do not know how to be a good mother. And they need the older women to teach them and to teach them how to love their husbands. And, you know, Hollywood has taught us how to lust. Hollywood has taught us how to, to desire uh, somebody that, you know, I, I used to watch the old, old show, Leave it to Beaver. And Miss Cleaver vacuumed her house with pearls around her neck. Mr. Cleaver came and sat down to the dinner table with a suit and tie every single time. Now my daddy never sat down with a suit and tie to eat uh, dinner and I have never done it either 
uh, on purpose. I make sure I'm comfortable when I eat. I like it that way. But it's not real. It's not real. And, and these things on television, these women turn over in the bed and their makeup is perfect and their hair is perfect and, and, and their night clothes is perfect. Well, <laughs> that is not real. Anybody that ever been married, you know that when they turn over in the morning, you say, go to the bathroom and brush your teeth before you say good morning to me. <laughs> Use some mouthwash. Comb your hair. Put on some clothes. You know, that's reality. One thing a husband needs from his wife, though, is respect. Ephesians 5.33 says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. He didn't say, I expect you to love him back. I expect you to respect him. If you're married and your husband's still alive, brag on him. Brag on him. If he goes and fixes a doorknob, tell him that's the best doorknob fixing job you've ever seen in your life. He mowed the grass, so that's the best grass mowing job I've ever seen. If he come home from work, thank, thank him for working and bringing money into the home. If he helped you raise the children, Thank him for being a good husband to help you raise the children. Men feel worth by their jobs because their jobs give them accolades. Men need accolades. They need that attaboy. And when women don't give them that, they go to work more because they get more accolades at the job. But if they got equal amount at home as they do the job, They'd probably spend a little bit more time at home if they said, if, you know, if you said, honey, you look good today. I, I, I think you're a handsome man. I think you're a good looking woman. You know, whatever your situation is, man to ma woman and woman to man, not woman to woman and man to man. That's, that's not right. But if you submit, Peter goes on to say that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Do you know that if you live a holy life and you live a godly life, then you can win your spouse, unsaved spouse, to the Lord. I have rarely seen an unsaved spouse. In fact, I had a woman who was married 50 58 or 59 years to this heathen of a man. I mean, he was a disgusting human being. I despised going to visit him, but the Lord made me over and over, and I mean over and over and over, go see him. And every time I'd talk to him about the Lord, he'd just say, I'm not ready for any of that right now. And for years, I'd go to his house and talk to him about the Lord, and he'd just basically, you know, tell, start quoting the book of Revelation to me and you know, there's nothing worse than a drunk singing Amazing Grace <laughs> and, and a, a, a person that don't know nothing about the Lord talking to you about the book of Revelation. I know preachers don't even have a clue about the book of Revelation, let alone some old heathen man. But anyway, this man was so disgusting and his wife died not seeing her husband come to know the Lord. And, and most women would have divorced that old sorry man. All those years she would have divorced him, but she didn't. He cheated on her, I don't know how many times, probably a hundred times or more. And she still stayed married to him. And, and he, she died. And he lived for three or four years after she did. And there came the day I continued to go by his house. And he would say to me, my godly wife lived a good life in front of me all those years. You know what the Lord did? After her death all that holy living she did came to haunt him. <laughs> came to haunt him and he finally surrendered because of her prayers and her holy life all those years. But I've seen a lot of families where the men turned around early in the marriage because the woman lived a godly life. It is 
God's perfect plan for a saved boy to meet a saved girl, to find the will of God at the altar of God and then come to the altar of marriage and for those two to be blended together as one. Oh, a marriage that's made in heaven can have a heavenly marriage. Well, that doesn't always happen. A lot of times people get married out of lust or out of, you know, whatever, and they get married and maybe they had a child and they thought they needed to get married and somebody forced them to get married and then they lived together for a long time and had nothing in common, didn't like each other, and then the wife gets saved and the husband's still lost and he drinks and carouses and she goes to church and, you know, that, that makes a very difficult, and I mean difficult marriage. But you made a vow before the Lord and so you, you stick with the marriage and you pray. And this verse tells us that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word, you see, nagging a man will never get him into church. It'll never get him toward the Lord. Telling him all his thoughts will never get him to change. It'll never happen. Telling him how sorry he is or trying to shame him or bully him into being what you want him to be is never going to work. Henpecking him is never going to make him a man of God. But when you hit your knees and you seek the face of God, God will turn things around. He'll either give you the grace to endure it or he'll give you the strength as to see that man changed. Peter goes on in verse 2 of chapter 3 to say, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. I had a woman that was married for 40 some odd years to her husband and uh, she got right with the Lord soon after they were married. He made a choice. He didn't want to get right with the Lord. He was kind of bitter at God for taking his godly mother. But he was raised in the church. He understood who God was, but he made a mental choice and, and claimed to be an atheist. I think he said that to keep preachers from talking to him. But I'd go to see him every week, and I'd offer him always grass. I'd do whatever I could to try to win that man to the Lord. And every time he'd say, Rev, you're wasting your time. I'm, a, I'm an atheist. I don't want to hear it. Well, his wife got into an accident, and when she got into an accident, she uh, was hanging between life and death. And because she had lived a godly life in front of him, he knew that God was the only one that could sustain her life. So he cried up to God in that hospital, and he said, Lord, if you'll, if you'll bring her back to me, I'll go to church every Sunday. He didn't say, I'd serve you, Lord. He just said, i go to church on Sunday. He was careful with his words. Well, she got healed, and for five years, that man came to church every Sunday morning. I'd sit and watch him from the piano. I'd sit and watch him in the back singing, oh, I want to see him look upon his face. I think that man ain't no, no atheist back there singing, oh, I want to see him. I think he just liked the tune. But nonetheless, he got really sick one night. And the Spirit of God told me he was going to die. And the Lord told me, go, tonight's the night he's going to accept the Lord. And I went to the hospital. And when I got there, it was around midnight at night. The Holy Spirit woke me up out of a dead sleep and said, go to the hospital tonight. He's going to get right with God. And I went to the hospital. And I said, I didn't tell him he was dying. I, I don't want anybody to make a decision based off the last minute I'm getting on, on the train, you know. I just said, you know, uh, you need to make things right with God. And he said, I, I want to. And I led that man through the sinner's prayer. And he wept his way to God. And the next morning, I called his wife as soon as I got back. And she was, I had already called her and said, I'm on my way. God told me tonight's his night. So I said, I want you to pray while I'm over there ministering to your husband. The next morning, she went up to the hospital as early as she could get up, and they let her in the door. And he said to her, he said, I did what I wanted to do my whole life. He said, I gave my heart to the Lord. 
and, and, and he begged her to forgive him. And then he said to her, he said, it's because of your life that I want God. See, if you'll live a holy life in front of your husband, women, or you teach the young women to live a godly life in front of their spouse, you'll see them turn around in the name of the Lord Jesus. 1 Peter 3.3 3 says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. No man, and I mean no man, likes a nagging wife. No man likes a nagging woman. Don't like to be around them. They just can't stand it. We're not built that way. And when that happens, we have to go outside, pull weeds, or run down the road, or get in the car and go somewhere. We can't take that kind of thing. But he's talking about women that were so worried about their outward godly appearance, but they didn't, they weren't concerned about their inward. Maybe you have an aunt or uncle or grandma or mama or whatever that, boy, they looked holiness, but their tongue was as long as, as the altar in the church. Their tongue was, was sharp and their tongue could cut you and their tongue could lie and deceive and backbite and gossip. And, and the husband looks at all that and they're like, Woman, you don't wear any makeup. You don't wear no jewelry. But you don't clean up the inside. God wants a woman to look holy on the outside, but he more so wants the woman to look holy on the inside. You say, well, what looks holy on the outside? I think you know what that is. I don't think I have to tell you that. I think if you look like a woman but you don't look like a painted woman. And I don't mean not wearing any makeup. I just mean not wearing a ton of it. You know, I, I, I think, you know, as the old saying is, if the barn needs painting, paint it. But don't, don't paint the barn so, so thick that the paint peels off and it looks weird. Anyway, let me move on. That's a whole other sub subject. He said it's incorruptible beauty. Did you know some of the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life were some of my mothers in the Lord, Sister Mamie Williams and Sister Ruth Garrett? They were my mothers in the Lord. They, they nurtured me in the, in the spirit. They, they, they taught me things of God. They, they spent time with me when I had troubles and trials. I called them, man. They were the first ones I called and talked to about issues and things. And they were beautiful people, just beautiful people, and everybody was drawn to them, not because of their physical appearance beauty, but because of the inward beauty of the heart. And then he goes on to say, not only incorruptible beauty, but gentle. In the online Strong's Concordance, it says gentleness or meekness is the opposite of self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trusting in God's goodness and control over the situation. The gentle person is not occupied with self at all. This is a work of the Holy Spirit, not of the human will. Man, that's a mouthful. It basically just means that when a person has a gentle spirit, a gentle spirit... That means that they're not depending on themselves, their own intellect, their own emotions. They're yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. So when you're in your, in your house and your husband's just offended you in some way and you turn around and you're with tears in your eyes and you're giving it to God saying, God, he just wounded me so bad and I just want to spit in his food before I take it over there. But you don't do it. Because you yield to the Lord and you know to pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. And you take his dinner over there and you don't slam it down. I had a lady in one of my churches. Her husband was uh, cheating at Monopoly. So she went over and she had done prepared a bowl of spaghetti. And instead of, uh, she said, do you want your spaghetti now? 
And he said, yeah, I sure do. So she went over there and without him noticing, she took the bowl and she dumped it all over his head. He said, there, there's your supper, you cheating Monopoly player. And I, <laughs> I've seen some characters in churches that I pastor. Not everybody goes to church is, is sanctified. Anyway, incorruptible, gentle, quiet spirit. What does that mean? It means a tranquil, peaceful spirit. Do you have a peaceful spirit? If you don't, if you're like a bull in a china shop, if you're always in a rage, if you're always upset, if you're always mouthing off, if you're always gossiping, or always spewing out negativity, if you're always just carrying on, you need to get to the altar and get your heart right with God because that is not what God has for you. It is not His best and it's not your best. You need a quiet spirit. This is foreign to men and women alike, but God wants us to have a gentle and a quiet spirit. A home where there's yelling and fighting does nothing but give children uh, 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 upsetness all the time. My mother and father fought like cats and dogs every single day. It was horrid. My mother would get over in front of my daddy who was a violent man and she'd say, hit me, hit me right here. Hit me, hit me right here. And then he'd deck her right there and she'd, she'd be sitting on the floor crying and my brother and I thought, like, you crazy woman, he, you told him to hit you. And, 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 and this is the kind of atmosphere I grew up in and I, I promised the Lord when I... When I left my home, that I would never live in a home like that. I would never allow myself to yell and scream and, 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 and fight and, and slap a woman and things of that nature. I tell you, both male and female need to learn how to bite their tongue and give our feelings to God. Someone in the marriage has to yield and pray. And if it's the man or the woman, Somebody needs to do it. God tells women to have a quiet spirit. How can you have a quiet spirit and not feel like you're being walked on? How can you have a quiet spirit and feel like you're not being lied to and manipulated or the husband like he's entitled to treat you in a bad way? You have to pray and pray again and pray again and pray as many times as necessary and God will give you a quiet spirit, but get ready to be tested. Get ready to be tested when you finally yield to God and say, I'm going to do that. Peter said, this is very precious in the sight of God. I don't know about you, but what Alicia thinks of me is, is, is not the most important thing in the world. I do want her to think highly of me. I want her to respect me. I want her to love me. But I'd rather know that God respected me and God loved me. I'd rather know that because it's more important on Judgment Day that God, that God thinks pretty good of me. And if I'm disobeying him by always having a loud mouth and an and a argumentative spirit, then I'm not pleasing to the Lord. And if you want to know how to please the Lord, I've had people, I've heard them in the older crowd, Lord, I want to please you. I want everything I say and everything I do to please you. Well, there's one thing you can do right there. Have a gentle and a quiet spirit. It's precious in the sight of God. All God's children said, oh me, oh me. Verse five, for in this manner, in former times the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. When a husband wants you to do something that's immoral something that frightens you, that scares you you don't have to do that. If you're in a home with violence, I'm not telling you to divorce your husband, but I am telling you to get out of there. You, you can go to a shelter. You can go to a family's home. You can call me. We can try to work something out to help you out. But uh, let me say this. Never stay with a violent man. That is crazy. 
Do not do that. God would never expect you to be a punching bag for some man. <laughs> That's the same thing for men. Don't you sit there and be a punching bag for some woman. I've seen both ways. Let me close with this reminder. Ephesians 5.21. I've read it twice now. I'm going to read it a third time because this is so important. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. You say, well, Pastor, I'm not married, so I don't have to submit to anybody. i got a cat at the house or a dog at the house. Well, he submits to me just fine, and we submit to one another, and that, that's all right with me. Let me tell you, this submission thing is for every part of your life. The Bible teaches us to go the extra mile. It tells us to be the good Samaritan. It tells us to be inconvenienced. It tells us to pray for those that despitefully use us and persecute us. It tells us to turn the other cheek. Okay? The word is full of submission, submission, submission. So if you're not married tonight, you're not off the hook. If you're a widow or a widower, you're not off the hook. Because you're still supposed to submit to your neighbor. To submit to your to your garbage man, to submit to the person that drives you crazy, to the kid that drives you crazy down the street. I used to work as a 911 operator in Florida, and for a year and eight months, I heard women calling up, men calling up, and I thought to myself, Lord, if I ever get to be that old and that crotchety, that just by some kid riding up and down the road on their bike or a four-wheeler, or uh, uh, whatever, that that drives me crazy. You know, <laughs> my aunt had a, a aunt, her name was Bessie Morgan. And Aunt Bessie Morgan lived in, I think it was South Carolina. And, and Aunt Bessie could play the piano beautifully. And so every afternoon, Aunt Bessie would get the neighborhood kids and she would see a kid, she'd stop them and she'd say, I'm having a, a snacks, and, and, and I'm having a Bible story every afternoon at 3 o'clock after school. I want you kids to come to the house, and we're going to have fun. And uh, Aunt Bessie would have those kids come to her house, and she'd have dozens and dozens of kids around her house. She'd bake them all kinds of cookies and cakes and whatever. And, and, and all those kids fed, you know, ate. They came because of the cookies and they came because she loved them. She loved them. She wasn't the crotchety old lady down the street. Don't be that crotchety old man or that crotchety old... Be an Aunt Bessie Morgan. Be the kind of person that, that people just want to... They want to cling to you. They want to come to your house. You're the house they go to when they're in trouble. When they need something from the Lord. You're the prayer partner. You're the person that can touch God for them. Let's be submissive one to another. Amen. Let's pray. Father, this is not an easy message. Marriage is not easy. Being in relationships is not easy. God, but you developed them because you said it's not good for man to be alone. And Lord, I, I know that it's not. And I thank you for my wife. I thank you that you blessed me with a wonderful spouse, a godly spouse. And I ask you, Father that you would just bless every marriage that's represented at the sound of my voice tonight. I pray, Father, that you would just uh, anoint their homes. Lord, if they are fighting and they are carrying on, that, Lord, that they'll get around an altar of prayer. And, Lord, that they'll start submitting one to another and start allowing the Lord to guide their marriage instead of having them guided out of their own mind. And God forbid we allow Hollywood to teach us what marriage is supposed to be like. We get our instruction from the Word of God. And Father, I pray for every single person that they'll learn how to submit one to another. And Lord, that every church that's represented listening to the sound of my voice, that every church would be submissive one to another. Every church member submissive one to another. That we're not in it for a fight or a show, but we're in it for the building of the kingdom of God. We bless you now in the name of Jesus and thank you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you Sunday morning in the great service 
uh, either in person or online. God bless you.